first things first, I love that hat. Do you think I could pull that off? <laughs> you never know, man. Hey, you just, you just got to make sure you go in the mirror when you, you're picking the one you want. I got you. <laughs> I got you. You know what? I feel like I'm going to go shopping, and then I'll, I'll find one that I sort of like. I'll send it to you, and you let me know if you think it looks good. Yeah, yeah. That's that Michael Jackson look. I, be, I, I, was, I was somewhat um, pulled into pulling off because, you know, on my first album, um, which is the album that the world, the whole world knows, um, the, the, the Kevin Little self-titled album um i was on the cover with my hat with my head done like this so you never really got to see my face originally right. until they did the cover for the single mm -hmm. and before <laughs> yeah. we uh, go on with the interview i do just want to tell you if you ever need a backup dancer once we go back to uh to a sense of normal and we, we go back to concerts and all that uh i yeah. mastered the floss i mastered the dab i mastered the whip and i created the double whip so i feel like i'm adequately prepared to be a backup dancer for you if you'd like <laughs> I'm seeing some kids doing a dance that look like a kangaroo these days. I'm like, what is going on here? You know, it's, uh, the dancers are getting stranger and stranger and stranger every year. I don't know if I can pull <laughs> that one off, but I'll certainly practice if that's something you like. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> oh, that is something else. I, I've not heard of that one just yet, but I will have to uh, do my homework and look into that. Uh, so talk about the beginnings of your music career. Your family encouraged you to pursue music at a young age. Was there ever mm -hmm. a specific time when you realized that, you know, pursuing music, being a musician was something you really wanted to do for the rest of your life? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the first time I got on stage and I, I, I got the response from the people in the audience, um, at a very young age, I was like 14. And um, I performed at a, a tea party that was a fundraiser at the JC's building in Kingston, St. Vincent, where I'm from. And, um, you know, the, the, it, was, it was an event where all the members of the dance group, we, we put our individual talents together and put together a production. So, you know, we're dancers, but, you know, to make the show interesting and, and keep the people happy, we put some other talents in there. So I wanted to display my talent as a singer. And um, when they heard my voice at first, when I rehearsed, for them, the members of the group, they went nuts. They were like, whoa, he could really sing. So I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, and you know, cause I never had a reaction about anything I do. So um, when I did perform was when it was finally convincing. Cause when I got on the stage and I started singing that song and I, I sung it like the record at the time, they, the, all the girls got up, left the table, you know, cause it was a very formal event. They were sipping on tea and eating um, cake. You know, so it was like a real, very formal sit down. All the women got up and flocked to the stage. And I think from then I, you know, I really got motivated and decided, yo, this is what I want to do. I am certainly happy that this is something you pursued because uh, you're absolutely phenomenal. You are so talented. Yeah, I remember uh, I had an interest, a brief moment, uh, as so many people do, that I wanted to be a musician. I was singing in the car, uh, going uh, back into St. Louis where, where I live with my family. And Celine Dion came on the radio and I started belting out Celine Dion, trying to hit some of those notes. And my family, they looked at me with so much disapproval. They're like, yep, uh, you should stick with your day job. No music for you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I had a lot of that. You know, I did get a lot of disapproving looks and a lot of people mad at me, a lot of people annoyed by me. Because guess what? You know, where I come from, this little island in the Caribbean, it's not Jamaica. And there's no big music industry. The only time that music is done where people actually earn money is carnival. And in those days, carnival was still just the one time of year. And then when the music, when the, the festivals was done and the period was over, the radios would switch back again to playing the dubs from the dancehall music and the, and the, the pop and R&B and hip hop music. So we never got that all year round radio play. So, you know, it was, it was kind of a situation where if you believed in yourself, you really had to believe and you really had to go and do things for yourself. You had to go and figure out how to do it. You, there was really nobody to teach you who have experienced the success. There was nobody to actually mentor you. There was nobody that you can really actually talk to because the few that did make it, they made it in the region and they're not... They, they're still not happy with themselves because you know how the music industry is. You know, you, you can make it in a region, but that doesn't mean that you actually become wealthy. You get some money for a time, but it's only so far that I can take you. So 
it, it was a kind of tricky situation. So I had to work every day, keep believing in my dream because the haters would be there. There would be the people who have gone through what they've gone through and just not encouraging you, not trying to motivate you to get where you want to get to. And um, it, it, it just, me, I just took, took that type of negativity and use it as fire to keep me going forward. Yeah, that's what you have to do. Life's too short. You just got to follow your dreams, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I just I just kept my, my focus and just kept going on my path. Yeah, that's what it's all about. You worked as a customs officer, a disc jockey, yeah. and then you invest your savings into recording Turn Me On. Enormous, uh, enormous hit. Seems like a very smart investment to me. Did you ever yeah. have any suspicion that the song would, would, would make it as, as, as great as it did? I mean, it's a legendary song. Uh, well, you know, what, what it is, is that when we recorded the record, um, uh, the producer, Adrian Bailey, he has his uh, recording studio in New York now, um, Sky Studios. Um, I wanted to send congratulations to him while I'm here, as a matter of fact. Um, he, um, I brought the song to him and he basically created the beat and everything that you hear behind there to follow the, the general guidelines of what I wanted to, to have come out of the, 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 the song and melody. And um, when we first started playing it for people, they were like, yo, whoa, what is this? You know, everybody was like, yo, this is different, you know? And then when we got on the radio, I remember the first day, put it on radio, it got some, some like, hmm, what is this? And then the next day of radio in St. Vincent, a radio announcer named Colin Graham took the song and he played it like 10 times nonstop. <laughs> like 10 times nonstop and it lit a fire under the song. It was ridiculous. Like everybody on the island just started playing the song everywhere. And, they, and at first they didn't believe it was me. So, you know, I am, um, I, I saw the, the, the movement building big, but you know, I, I had seen other artists around me become successful in the island, but I didn't know for sure where the song would go. Um, and I think it was in 2003 when we finally saw things come to fruition, you know, cause in 2001 we released it and we worked and we worked, we put out other songs that became hits in the Caribbean and stuff like that. And, but this song was just so big. It was what my name was known for, but knew, nobody knew what I looked like because there was no YouTube. There was no, no Facebook. It was only MySpace and, and, and the, the, the pair to pair kind of streaming services, not even streaming. It's like you downloading music illegally over the internet. You know, like LimeWire and these things. This is how music was being shared. And um, I think it was when I, I got to Jamaica, because it, it came out of Trinidad and Tobago for their carnival, which is the biggest in the Caribbean. Once your music make it there, you know you're going to get work in the Caribbean. But when I got to Jamaica and I saw the response and the way that, you know, the dance hall man and them in, in dance hall music, they were dealing with me like if I was one of them. They wasn't treating me like I was a, a soak artist. They were treating me like I was a dance hall artist because the song had all those different feels to it. Yeah. So I think it was then that I really realized that, yo, this thing is going to be huge. Yeah. I'll tell you what, man. So my dad is a huge fan of yours. And I, when I announced to him that I was going to be interviewing you, he started yeah. singing your song and he's not a good singer and he sucks at dancing. <laughs> and he started dancing in the kitchen. I was going to videotape it just because it, and show it to you just because it's that comical. But, but that song, listening to it, it's impossible not to dance to. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yo, you know, sometimes, you know, um, you know, I, I, I was looking at an interview for Michael Jackson and someone was asking him, yo, how do you write a song? How do you, where does the inspiration come from? Uh, how do you, do you go, go about your thought process doing it? And Michael was like, yo, you know, it just, it's, it, it comes from above, you know, it just comes to you, you know, it's, it's about that when everything comes together and feels right. And at the time, I think that for me, what was happening in my life, I was, I was partying. I was out every night partying with girls in, in karaoke after parties and being the host at after parties. I was doing um, Mr. Boombastic for Shaggy at one of the nights where I was hosting. 
and getting big reviews and having so much interaction with people and I was getting popular and being in that type of scenario with girls every night. So I think that that's where that story was able to come out of me so so easily. And then um, the the experiences that I had before, the people, the contacts that I made before in my home country because I was so involved in music. Because after I realized that singing would work for me, when you asked me how I got my start, from that day when I realized I started, I formed my own group in school. I, you know, I, I, I got hired by bands to be one of their lead vocalists and stuff like that. So I got to meet a lot of people who are involved in music in my country. And, and all those little things from past to present came together to bring me to that moment where I recorded that song. And I've, I've not even touched all of the different things. It's just so much different things have to happen for you to create a piece of music and make it successful. Absolutely. And that's absolutely wonderful. Mm. You know, it, it's crazy to think that even the smallest of experiences in life, ones that, you know, you think in a couple of years, you just completely forget about how they come back into your life and really impact the future. Yeah, it, yeah that's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like to say that life is math. You know, mathematics is, is the whole universe. Everything in this universe is built on math. And you can, on math, you can, you can look back at your life and you can add up all the different experiences to see what, how it, how it equivocated to what, where you are today, yeah. you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Looking back a little bit, what have been, and of course the best is yet to come for you, but what have been some of your uh, favorite moments, some of those highlights that just pop into mind? Oh, wow, man. I think um, the first major concert I did um, in America, um, and you know, for me, that was a big deal because I'm not American. Uh, at the time, I was not American, and I was a Caribbean artist just trying to, to get through. But to be on the same stage with 50 Cent at the time when he was at his peak with his first big album, I was one of the openers for that show. Um, they had like about, excuse me, 50,000 people in this arena in Rhode Island. And um, they brought me on the show as one of the opening acts because, you know, I'm, I'm an island cat. I'm not American. They're not looking at me as a hip hop or an R&B star. They're like, yo, we're going to give this kid an opportunity. His song is really blowing up right now. You know, the, the radio that, broke, that was behind the show was real running turn me on. It was playing every hour on the hour. And yo, it was the most incredible experience for me to be on stage and look out at 50,000 people in an arena. I have, it was the first time I had felt that way. And to hear them, because it was scary, you know, there were a few opening acts that were young acts from record labels that were signed. And, you know, they didn't really get no good reviews when they, they went on. And, yo, from the time I opened my mouth on the mic, the reaction, the way the people just was singing every single line. This was 2003. They were singing every single line, like if the song was made in America, like if it's theirs. You know, and it, it, I, yo, I, I, I didn't even have to say a word. I literally ripped my shirt off. I was, was, was swinging my shirt in the air. And, yo, it was, it was crazy, you know? But that is one of my most insane um, uh, experiences with my music. And from there, I got signed to um, Atlantic Records after every label started calling me from all over the world to sign me. Yeah. You were on the charts everywhere globally. I mean, that, that, once again, that song was huge. And about that concert, it must have been nerve wracking at first. But once you have the audience singing your songs, it, it must yeah. have just, I mean, you must have just, it must have been so surreal. Yeah, no, because I was very nervous. You know, I was back there. My manager was nervous. She was saying to me, oh, you know, just go do your best. You know, I don't know what the reaction is going to be, but do your best. You know, so when they said my name, the crowd was some people knew who I was, some people didn't. And then when they heard the song start, it went bazonkers. From the time they heard, ding, 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 yeah. that it was over. <laughs> they certainly knew who you were after that concert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've obviously collaborated with so many of the top musicians. Is there anyone that you haven't collaborated with, past or present, that you'd like to collaborate with? Um, man, I, I always was dreaming to collaborate with Michael Jackson. Um, 
I think somebody who I would love to one of these days, just not even if I, if I don't even get to sing a song with him, just get to sit down and meet him and talk with him is Stevie Wonder. You know, Stevie Wonder is, is, is ultimate. You know, he was, he is, he is past, present and future still because Stevie was there for James Brown. He was there for Michael Jackson. And, and yet Michael Jackson, who's known as the biggest pop star of all times, was idolizing these guys, you know, James Brown and, and Jackie, Jackie Wilson. And, and these guys were there. Stevie Wonder was there for these guys, you know? So Stevie is like the ultimate. I really, really want to meet him one day. Yeah. Yo, love, I love Jackie Wilson. He's one of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, nah. He, yo, Jackie, Jackie was the truth. <laughs> That dude yeah, hit some man. crazy notes, and he could dance really well. Yeah, yeah, dance and sing at the same time. And that that he was like one of the main inspirations behind Michael Jackson's um, stage performance. Oh, yeah, really. Yeah, that is awesome. The last thing I want to touch on before we go, uh, since you've been in the music industry for so long, uh, in your eyes, from your perspective, how has it kind of changed since two thousand three? I'm sure. I'm sure social media is, is a big part of your answer here. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the advent of social media has really um, caused an upheaval of the, I would say, the norm of the industry. You know, the, the labels had the industry in a chokehold because the industry is the most unregulated industry in the world, music industry. And um, it's something that needs to be fixed. Um, it's very discombobulated. And that's why the labels had it that way. The the good thing is that social media has leveled the playing field. It doesn't mean that you have the kind of resources that a major has, but now you have the access that the majors have to the people to be able to promote and market yourself. If you get a, a, a investor or somebody and you get the right promotional and marketing team, and you have the right record, you can really become a success without the use of a major label. Yeah. I, I yeah. kind of wonder if Turn Me On had come out like say last year, we, you know, social media at its peak, what that would have been like. Cause I mean, still, regardless, the song would have been enormous either way, but I just wonder what it would have been like. Yeah, it would have been madness, you know I mean? <laughs> the thing is that um, it, 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 it couldn't have come out with these times because in these times now, everything is just so quick. Yeah. And everybody can reach everybody now. But Turn Me On was a song designed with the with the difficulties of the time that it had to face i was in a place where i wanted I, sometimes i wanted to be a jamaican because i want to i want to be like them dance hall artists singing a dance hall song all, every minute you hear a new dance hall song on the radio you know and you were like yo i, I was there going man i gotta find a way to get myself heard and I came up with the song and said, yo, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. I heard a, a, the artist who's on the song, Madzat, he did before, the year before I released Turn Me On, he did a song where he said, he, he took Tong song for Cisco and he said, let we mash dung tong. Let me see the rags then. Let me see the flags then. Because you know, we party in carnival rags and flags in the air and everybody marching in the street and partying. So he took Tong Song and interpolated it to that. So I said, yo, let me do that. This is a great way for me to try to cross over. I took this song for 112 called All, All My Love and I changed up the melody and, uh, and the lyrics to turn me on. And that's how turn me on became because there were certain adversities that I had to face to get myself heard and me wanting to sing R&B and wanting to be a dancehall artist, but have to um, basically deal with what's happening local because we weren't rating soca music at the time because we felt like, yo, it was just happening once a year and you can't get paid. You can't make no money from it. So I said, you know what? Let me fix something. So I went at soca music with this song to fix the music and add R&B to it, add dance all to it. So to make it cross over 
and I didn't expect it to work, but it crossed borders. There was no social media, nothing. That's why the song still does what it does because it was a song that was to bridge gaps and, and, and create connections in the world internationally. But I didn't expect it to work. <laughs> That's wonderful. You are absolutely incredible. I'm not going to take any more of your time. I'm going to leave the floor to you. Uh, you could talk about new music. How can people find you on social media? All that good stuff. Well, yo, you know, you can find me um, facebook.com slash Kevin Little Music. Also find me instagram.com slash Kevin Little. Um, you know, you got to spell it a little with a Y. It's not L-I, not Stuart Little, Kevin Little. You know what I mean? But hey, I got new music out this year. I have this song I'll call Nikki. But, um, you know, the coronavirus and everything, a lot of things got slowed down. And um, I have other new music that's to come this year, but they're going to come next year. Um, we have a major remake of Turn Me On that's been um, being teased right now with um, Faruko, J Balvin, um, Prince Royce, Carl G. <laughs> um, the, the executive producer, um, Alex Sensation. Yo, we, we got a huge one to come as well there. Another remake. 